Um, so it's time for our next session. Uh, over the last several months, uh, a, a working group on the network strategy has been uh, getting together to discuss some of the use cases that we think would be valuable to discuss in the context of zero surveillance. So on that note, I'd like to present the moderators for this session and the co-chairs of this working group, Drs. Agatha Jassim and Dr. Steve Drews. Um, Dr. Agatha Jassim is a clinical microbiologist and the program head of the virology lab at the BC CDC. She's also a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at UBC. Um, Dr. Jassim oversees diagnostic services and has extensive expertise in developing and implementing molecular and serological based tests for several organisms, including respiratory pathogens and those causing sexually transmitted and blood bloodborne infections. Um, she's also involved. That's enough. Okay. <laughs> they all have very impressive bios, so maybe I'll, I'll end it here. Um, and as I said, Dr. Jassim is a co-chair of the Network Strategy Working Group. Um, Dr. Steve Drews, he is somewhere in the room right there. Uh, he's also a clinical microbiologist and the associate director um, microbiology at the Canadian Blood Services, where he leads the medical microbiology laboratories and provides guidance on transmissible diseases, testing, microbiology, and infectious diseases issues. He's also a professor at the University of Alberta and has a wide range of expertise, including transfusion medicine, blood banking, vaccine effectiveness, and ID epidemiology. He's also the co-chair of the Humanities Network Strategy Working Group. So I'm gonna let uh, Agatha and Steve take over from here. So thank you, uh, Dr. Burrell. Uh, we'd like to introduce the panelists for the session. So the first uh, speaker is Dr. Shelley Bulletin. Uh, Shelley is the director of the Center for Vaccine Preventable Diseases and an associate professor at Dow Atlanta School of Public Health, Department of Lab Medicine and Pathobiology at U of T at University of Toronto. She's also a scientist at Public Health Ontario, applying uh, public health lens. Uh, Shelley's studies combine epidemiologic and microbiologic methods to answer questions related to population immunity, and vaccine effectiveness and determine our future risk for outbreaks or in epidemics. At PHO, Dr. Bulletin leads a serial epidemiology program to estimate population immunity to vaccine preventable diseases. Shelley, take it away. Can you hear me? I mean, and you can see my slides, right? Okay, amazing. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Uh, just before I start, I want to disclose that the Center for Vaccine Preventable Diseases, of which I'm director, is supported by various funding sources, including vaccine manufacturers. Uh, we have a robust set of governance processes at the university to ensure that we are independent. Okay, uh, I think there is already a uh, wonderful talk uh, by Bill and Andrea before about this. So I'm going to quickly uh, summarize CIRA surveys as a tool for surveillance and evaluating public health programs. Uh, we've been using them to understand emerging infections or infections that are not emerging but are not reportable. So we don't necessarily know how much is circulating. We can use them to look at the population burden of disease or immunity, or specifically to look at particular subgroups to predict the risk of outbreaks. Uh, we often use them to uh, evaluate immunization programs. So uh, serosurveillance is done in order to decide whether to initiate an immunization program, then to evaluate the immunization program. Then sometimes we change the program, so we add a dose or we change the timing, and that needs to be evaluated as well. And lastly, as we all recall from COVID-19, it's a great dual tool to understand how our public health measures are doing in an emergency. So CIRA surveillance is a very, very traditional data source for surveillance, and it's been extensively used for many pathogens going back 40 years. So this is a table that shows this, and we see that the United Kingdom has been doing CIRA surveys since the 80s. Netherlands as well uses zero surveillance for decision making. Australia and the United States, uh, both through the NHANES study and extensive leadership 
for uh, global health studies, as was described before, using either single bead assays or multi bead assays. Um, you will notice that measles is in every single one of these columns. And that's because in my mind, measles is really the prototypical example of uh, a good use case for zero surveillance. This is one of the first, if not the first examples of measles zero surveys being used to make policy. Uh, this is measles in England in 1994, during which there was a huge increase of cases, 70% increase from 1993, as you can see from the figure in the top right. Uh, the interesting thing about this outbreak is that the largest proportion of cases were in older children. And this is not what we usually see. Usually the larger proportion of cases is in young children under five. And the reason that this happened is that when these children were eligible for vaccine, when they were younger, they were eligible for one dose at the time, but coverage wasn't great. So coverage was between 70 and 80% for uh, these cohorts. And while that is enough to dramatically decrease the incidence of measles, it still leaves susceptibility gaps. So you end up in every cohort having some people that are not immunized, but they also haven't been infected. And when you do that over and over for a few years, you end up accumulating susceptibles. And in 1994, really, that was the tipping point towards an outbreak. Uh, so some math modeling was done and predicted an epidemic of up to 200,000 cases uh, with 30 to 60 deaths. And again, really, the concern here was the older uh, average age of infection. And, uh, you know, people who are not young children uh, are at risk, uh, greater risk than younger children for complications and even death. So the policy decision that was made was to do a mass immunization campaign for all kids five to 16 years. This was done in November of 1994, and they achieved 92% coverage, which is like really incredible. Don't know if we could do that now. Um, and these data with other data were also used to decide that a second dose of measles vaccine was needed to be added to the program, and that happened in 96. So when we first started uh, working on uh, doing serosurveillance in Canada through uh, the Immunity of Canadians and Risk of Epidemics Network, it was 2010, and uh, we were created to answer questions related to population immunity, specifically for vaccine-preventable diseases. And, you know, historically, Canada had not done any core public health work, had not used serosurveillance as a surveillance stream. So we kind of fell through the cracks because public health folks thought we were research, but research funders thought we were surveillance. And so it was very hard to get funding. Um, and so the ICARE and Eric and all the other people who were doing Sierra surveys at the time mostly used research funding, and these are our uh, research funders, uh, to get this work done. So we would do basically one-off research proposal to fund one project, and then we would do another with no funding for a program. Uh, in later years, the Canadian Immunization Research Network, or CERN, came along, and now iCare is very fortunate to be part of the lab network for CERN and to be able to have a modest sum of money to do this on a regular basis. Um, when we created the infrastructure for the network, we um, made it as you know, in various provinces and for a couple of reasons. First of all, we'd like to build lab capacity across Canada. And second of all, seer surveillance is really multidisciplinary. There isn't one person that has all the pieces of the puzzle and it really is about working together. So as you can see in uh, light blue are places from which we have gotten specimens. For, so residual specimens from Public Health Ontario, uh, specimens from Statistics Canada, from Sick Children's Hospital for both infants and parents, and we're currently partnering with Canadian Blood Services in Hema, Quebec. Uh, we do the vast majority of our testing with the National Microbiology Lab. We've been collaborating for over a decade. Uh, and a lot of our testing is also done in Nova Scotia. And at the University of Toronto, we do the epi analysis and the overall coordination. So when we first started doing this work, um, we had a lot of questions about the best way to go forward. And a lot of that is because the Canadian vaccine program landscape is incredibly complex. 
We have 13 jurisdictions, 10 provinces in three territories, and each of them has a heterogeneous population within themselves and between. So you can't take findings from one province or territory and, and have it be necessarily representative of another. We have NASI, which is a, a national immunization advisory group, and it makes immunization recommendations. But the delivery of vaccines is up to the provinces and territories. And as a result, we have varying schedules for different vaccines between provinces. Uh, we have a lot of vaccine preventable diseases that are reportable to public health, but almost always they're underreported. So we have some idea of what's happening from case surveillance, but probably not complete. And we have no national immunization registry. And this is a, a really big gap because we actually don't know who in the population is immunized and who isn't. We do have some uh, coverage data at the provincial level and the national level, but again, we don't have compre comprehensive coverage data about you know, what proportion of every single age group is protected. Uh, a good example of this is Ontario, where I'm from, where we focus our efforts on school-aged children and we measure their coverage to certain antigens at age seven and 17, but we have very little idea in terms of adult coverage. We also have many newcomers uh, coming in and they might not have been there when they were a school-aged child and had their, their immunization status um, added to our data. Uh, and they sometimes come in with different immunity profiles. So they could be immune through infection or susceptible, or they could have been vaccinated on a different schedule or a different vaccine. And lastly, we need to uh, take into account that even if we had perfect coverage data in our registry, uh, vaccine immunity can wane uh, for several diseases, for example, pertussis, which is whooping cough, varicella, which is chickenpox, and even measles. And so sometimes, even with good coverage data, you still need to triangulate it with other data. So our uh, first pathogen that we did was measles, and we keep doing measles serous surveillance. It's definitely has been a big focus. And so why focus on measles? So Canada eliminated measles in 1998. And so what that means is that measles does not circulate endemically in our population. But as you know, because you see it in the news, measles is imported into Canada through travel on a regular basis. So everyone who was born since 1998, who grew up here, uh, should be protected through vaccine, not through infection, because it hasn't been circulating and we administer two doses and we start the first dose at 12 months. Um, we also assume that individuals who were born before 1970 would have gotten measles at children and they're immune. Measles is one of the most infectious diseases, if not the most infectious disease, and you need 95% of the population to be immune. This is really, really hard to achieve, even in you know, the best circumstances. And it's very hard to know whether we're meeting that population immunity threshold in the absence of a registry or comprehensive coverage data. And really, that's why we do serious surveillance for measles, because it allows us to have Another data source to evaluate if we're going to be able to sustain our elimination status, uh, to be able to predict outbreaks ahead of time, and also to evaluate our immunization programs. And serosurveillance for measles is also something that is recommended by the World Health Organization. So this is uh, one of the first studies that we did looking at measles population immunity. Uh, it's from the Canadian Health Measures Survey, which is a Statistics Canada survey that happens every two years. They collect data and specimens, and then we took the specimens, uh, tested them for measles, and analyzed the results. In all, we did 11,000 specimens, but I'm just going to show Ontario data, which is 3,700 specimens. And uh, the theme for this slide and actually for the whole presentation is that even if you have adequate vaccine coverage, maintaining high population immunity is very, very challenging. So these are our results from our first survey. I will say we've also done this with residual sera and the results were almost exactly the same. And we've learned a lot about using Canadian health measures versus residual specimens. And I'm happy to talk about it after. Um, on the x-axis, we have age group. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of individuals whose specimens were beyond the threshold of protection that we determined in our lab. And I'm very happy to go into the methods during the discussion period as well. So I'm just going to orient us a bit. 
This is our 95% threshold. You see that we are not meeting it for any age group except the oldest age group. And in terms so of can I jump who in for a sec? You got about yeah. three minutes to wrap this part up and then we go into questions. Okay. Um, so uh, these younger individuals are eliminated. Uh, they were born into an elimination setting and they should be immunized with either one or two doses. And then these individuals here are either vaccinated or infected, or if they're older then they're infected through um, previous measles disease. Uh, what we did to understand this, because we were a little bit concerned with the low levels of immunity, was we overlaid some coverage data and we saw that, interestingly, kids who were recently immunized uh, seem to have, you know, very close immunity estimates and coverage estimates. But as you get farther away from uh, the time that you were immunized, uh, you do see a decrease of antibodies. And interestingly, when you add in the equivocal specimens, so the gray zones, uh, the coverage estimates and the immunity estimates actually match right up. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip all of this and I'm going to get to the interpretation. Um, we're not sure whether measles will be reestablished in Canada. Our, our CIRA survey results don't look great. We haven't had raging outbreaks, but on the other hand, uh, we did have a large outbreak in Quebec in 2011 that nearly cost us our elimination status. Uh, we need to understand if the seronegative individuals are truly susceptible or whether they have some memory humoral or cellular response. Uh, and it is very hard to know the scope of the problem because, you know, in our medical system, we don't usually do serology. Uh, going back to what uh, Bill said in the discussion previously, it's very important to have these other data. So you need to know who are you sampling, you know, their sex, their age, where they're from, what is the local burden of infection, and who in your sample is in the least vaccine eligible, if not individual vaccine status. And so often we use sera surveys as hypothesis generating as opposed to actual um, you know, answering questions are kind of a pathway to answer questions and make some more questions. In terms of policy, we've learned a lot. We've learned that we need a vaccine registry to understand who is vaccinated. We've learned that we need to increase our efforts to make sure our whole population has two doses. Uh, we do have some decrease in humoral immunity that has implications for age at first dose. Uh, we've also learned that some populations that we historically thought were immune actually aren't. Um, and all of these, some of this has already been implemented in policy and some of it hasn't been. So I think with that, I will wrap up. In terms of future directions, we are working with Canadian Blood Services and HEMA Quebec for a national measles sear survey and also working to link Public Health Ontario specimens um, in order to understand who these samples are from and also looking at doing cellular immunity assays uh, in parallel to serous surveys to get a better understanding of an immunity status. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, a lot of people. First and foremost, Natasha Crowcroft, who was the inaugural PI of iCare, uh, Todd Hatchett, who co-leads the CERN uh, lab network with me, and Alberto Severini from the National Microbiology Lab. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shelly. And sorry, we do have to keep things on time. That's why. So I appreciate you just letting us um, cut you off a little bit there. So we will take a couple of questions for you specifically before we move on to other panelists. Or you got, you got till 10 45. Till 10, I don't know what time it is. <laughs> no, no, that's she. Okay, sorry. No, no, that's later. We'll just take a couple of minutes questions for you. Till, yeah. Thanks. Okay, Thank so you. in this question, Shelley, of surveillance versus research, mm. how sustainable is the funding now for eye care? Are you established going forward internally? <laughs> okay, so first of all, hi, Kate. It's nice to see you. Uh, we are super fortunate to have CERN because it really is perfect for all these activities. You can name them studies or you can name them research that fall through the cracks. So um, we are submitting our CERN renewal on the 20th, which I believe is Tuesday for another five years. Uh, that gives us a modest amount of funding to, to 
focus very carefully on what we think is more important, but we would certainly supplement with uh, writing other proposals to make sure that we always have a lot of options for funding rather than just counting on one thing. Yeah, thanks, Shelley. Great um, and great work. Uh, two questions, if I may. Um, one is with respect to uh, survey sampling strategy. Um, I, I'm delighted that you're teaming up with CBS and HQ for a national survey, um, but that obviously will be drawing on residual blood. Um, is there an opportunity, and those are, those are your older cohorts, uh, your older at, um, people 16 and over, 17 and over, right? Um, how, what is the best strategy for getting to children? And I'm just wondering, uh, does the kernels network created through popcorn uh, provide you with some butter to um, access children uh, uh, versus, um, you know, continually relying on either the Canadian Health Measures Survey or something else? So that's question one. Question two, you mentioned the issue of the distinction between humoral and cellular uh, immune protection and that the humoral immunity may not be, may underestimate the degree of protection potentially. I'm just wondering, do we have studies um, that are looking at that in more depth um, and perhaps correlating le threshold levels of humoral immunity with, um, um, you know, cellular, um, w which corresponds better with um, loss of protection uh, based on sort of more elegant cellular measures of immunity? Okay. Thank you. Those are two wonderful questions. So. Um, going in order, uh, I do think that representative samples from children are very, very difficult because children don't get blood taken. Statistics Canada specimens actually go down to age three. Whether or not they're representative is a different question. You will notice that those data were quite old, and that's because it took us five years to get access to these specimens, to jump through all uh, the hoops that we needed to, so certainly not timely. Uh, Popcorn kernels is definitely an option. We've actually done this not through popcorn kernels, but just through SickHeads, where we looked at the laboratory information system and excluded anyone who might have a medical condition that affects their antibody level. Uh, SickHeads is a specialist hospital, but also is a catchment area for people just bringing their kids to the emergency room. And, and we've had quite a uh, a lot of success there. And when we replicate our studies, we find similar results over and over again, uh, which is encouraging. In terms of humoral versus cellular, so yes, eye care is uh, currently looking at this because there's only so many times that we can do a humoral uh, study, a sera survey, and see that uh, population immunity is inadequate. Uh, for measles, uh, humoral and cellular immunity actually don't correlate at all. Uh, so we can't make any assumptions. Uh, previous studies that have been done in vaccinated individuals show that about 20% of people that are vaccinated and don't have a humoral response actually have a cellular response, but cellular responses aren't standardized. So it's difficult to understand what that means. And I think that even, I'm not an immunologist is the disclaimer, but I think that even if someone has a good cellular response, that's not necessarily going to stop them from being infected in the absence of antibodies circulating. Hey, thank you, Shelley. We're still going to take some questions, but Varun, I just we're looking for your hand, so I'm assuming there's no online questions. But I do want to um, remind our online participants to ask questions that we're going to be looking out for your hands. But I know. Steve Hi, Shelley. I was just wondering if you could expand on the correlative immunity for um, immunology testing, and in particular, um, given that high throughput correlative immunity testing might not be available, what's a good proxy assay to determine uh, general population immunity? So yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. Uh, there's a dogma that the correlative protection is 120 MIU per mil. When you dig into the data behind that, you find that uh, it's rather thin. Uh, and so, you know, we have done studies, and I see Bill there, I'm sure Bill has, I actually know Bill has as well, uh, looking at serious surveys with different cutoffs. And it makes a really, really big difference. If you cut everybody off at 120, Canada's actually doing just fine. Um, you ask a difficult question 
about what the correlative protection uh, or how to measure correlate protection in the absence of a cumbersome reference method like print. I don't have an answer for you, but I will say that the Canadian Immunization Guide says that if you have two doses, your antibody level actually doesn't matter. So if you do serology and you're negative, but you have two doses, you're actually okay. So, I mean, we need to figure out whether that is still a valid statement to be making, but if it is, then uh, the, the test is, it matters a little bit less. Thanks. Um, I think we can do one more question. We've got two minutes. Hi, Shelley. Good to see you. Hi, Bill. There's, uh, as you know, there's a kind of renewed glo discussion about global measles eradication and kind of the standard default pathway to that is to achieve 95% coverage with two doses, you know, everywhere in the world. And I don't think we'll ever get to that. And so one of the things that's most fascinating to me about the data you presented is that Canada has achieved and sustained measles elimination despite the immunity gaps that you showed, you know, from the seroprevalence data. And I think one interesting area of work going forward is to try to understand how can countries or regions, how do they achieve and sustain elimination despite these immunity gaps? Because it suggests that this uh, impossible goal of, of getting, I'm not saying that shouldn't be our aspiration. Uh, it should be our aspiration to get 95% coverage with two doses everywhere. But I think this is a good example of how, and it, it's true with every country that's eliminated measles. They haven't done it that way. The United States has eliminated measles, but we have pockets of susceptibles. And so trying to understand kind of more about where those susceptibles are and why they aren't sustaining measles virus transmission, I think is really interesting. Thank you. I'm going to answer quickly in the interest of time. Uh, this is why we're starting to look at other things like cellular immunity, because we do need to interpret this a little bit better. Um, and I, you know, concur, we haven't had large outbreaks. Uh, in 2011, there was an outbreak in Quebec that had over 700 cases. Uh, and that was, you know, they had many importations, but one was a super spreader event. And so, you know, we see that it can happen in our setting. We also occasionally, at least in Ontario, have measles cases that pop up with no travel history. And so this tells us that it's possible that measles is circulating and we don't know. Um, all of these things together are a little bit concerning. And when you add in our current coverage estimates for school age children as a result of COVID, I am a little bit more worried than I was before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. We'll give you a round of applause. I hope you can stay on. A little bit. Uh, so we are going to move to two more speakers before the break. And I think we're going to have back to back talks and then and then we'll have a sort of question period. So do you want to introduce the yeah, first speaker? Sure. And then I'll... So we have uh, uh, two co-speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Sheila O'Brien and Iris Ganser. So uh, Sheila has been the head of epidemiology and surveillance at CBS Canadian Blood Services for over 20 years, an adjunct prof in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. Her areas of interest include donor health, surveillance of infectious diseases in blood donors, Stats in Public Health. She's published over 100 peer-reviewed papers and serves on a number of CBS Canadian International Committees. Notably a member of the former chair of the Donor History Task Force of the AABB in the U.S. and the vice chair of Transfusion Trans Transmitted Infectious Diseases, the Working Party of the International Society for Blood Transfusion. Um, she's a section editor for Vox Sanguinis. Iris Ganser is currently a PhD student in epidemiology, pursuing her doctoral studies jointly at McGill in here, essentially, and the University of Bordeaux in France. She holds an MSc in Epidemiology from McGill and a Master's in Public Health Data Science from the University of Bordeaux and an, M okay, and an MSc degree in Molecular Medicine from the University of Regensburg. Her research interests lie in math and stats modeling, simulations, and infectious disease epidemiology in her thesis projects. She's focused on studying the effectiveness of non-pharmaceutical pharmaceutical interventions as SARS-CoV-2 using math models. Additionally, she's worked on assembling antibody responses uh, against SARS-CoV-2. Sheila and Iris, please. And Iris, I think, wanted to say something too. Oh, here. Oh, 
Hello, everyone. Um, so I'll talk about the um, longitudinal trends in um, immunity from repeat blood donors. And then afterwards, Sheila is going to talk a bit um, about um, the Canadian Blood Services sampling. So um, as a little bit of background, the CITF and Canadian Blood Services have partnered early in the pandemic um, for zero surveillance. So Canadian Blood Services samples blood from their donors um, and tests that against SARS-CoV-2 antibodies and estimates seroprevalence in the population. And with these data and other data sources, the CITF has been able to model seroprevalence in Canada, which has been especially important um, after the Omicron era because then testing virtually stopped. And one other thing that's important for seroprevalence is also assessing um, antibody waning because um, we cannot really distinguish new infections versus reinfections. And especially there's a scarcity of data sets of, with longitudinal data to assess um, natural immunity waning. And this is where the CBS data provides a great opportunity. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the methods of CBS. So they sample every month um, in a cross-sectional design in all provinces except Quebec. And they sample blood from um, whole blood donors who can donate every two to three months, but roughly donate, you usually donate twice per year. Um, plasma donors who can donate every week and platelet donors that can donate every two weeks. And at the time of donation, the donors must be well um, and not have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 in uh, the previous two weeks or not have been hospitalized due to it in the previous three weeks. And also, they must not have been in contact with someone who had COVID-19. And they measured antibodies with two assays. First, from um, the start of the pandemic until the end of 2020, blood was all, uh, um, yeah, the antibodies were only measured with an Abbott assay, and it was only they only measured antibodies against the nucleocapsid, so only natural infection. Could, no, yeah. Um, and then when, and when the vaccination started, they switched the assay to a Roche assay with higher sensitivity. Um, and they measured antibodies against the spike protein and against the nucleocapsid protein. And that way we can distinguish natural infections because then they would have both antibodies from um, vaccines where the donors then only had the anti-spike protein or the anti-spike antibodies. So um, to show you a little bit of the numbers that we have, the CBS has shared over one data on over one million donors, which means well over one million donations. On average, um, we have 2.5 donations per donor. And because we were interested in antibody waning, we limited these 1 million donors or over 1 million donors to about 150,000 donors who had been infected previously, so who had detectable anti-N antibodies and who had repeat measurements. And that still leaves us with um, a lot of donations. So um, you see here in the slide that um, the majority are two or three blood donations, but still if you look at over 10 donations, we still have like approximately 4,500 donors. And if we focus on them a bit about the demographics, you can see that most of the donors were male, white, and in the older age groups. And the majority of them were from Alberta and BC. Yeah, <laughs> I see surprised faces. <laughs> this is how it is. Um, the <laughs> in, in general, um, the initial detection of uh, anti-N antibodies was during the Omicron era, not surprising. And then even after the first observed NTN positivity, we still have a lot of donations for the longitudinal follow-up of the waning. So let's look about at the data a bit closer. So here in this graph, um, you can see on the bottom um, the NTN antibodies plotted on a log 10 scale. And um, the scale is a signal to, uh, yeah, signal to cutoff ratio scale. 
Mm, and on the top, you can see the anti-S antibodies also on a log scale. And then we separated them by one infection on the top, then two infections on the middle, and three detected infections on the bottom. If we zoom in a bit, um, here you see t data from two individuals, two younger individuals. Um, and if we focus on the bottom right one, you can see that this person probably got infected once in early 2022, and then probably twice more later on, and you can also see the nice waning of the NTN antibodies. Also on top you see the NTS, so this person got vaccinated before they were infected, and the little triangles on top indicate vaccinations. But the problem with this vaccination data is that it's self-reported. And the only question that was asked was, have you been vaccinated in the previous three months? So, um, for example, for the top person, they clearly were vaccinated too, but they didn't report any vaccinations. Um, we can see the same um, with two older individuals here. So they were frequently vaccinated and then at some point infected the top person twice, um, the bottom person once. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we look at, um, because we're interested in the waning, I narrowed down this cohort to donors who had at least 10 donations and who had been had a measurement within the 90 days before they first detected zero positivity. And here I aligned them all at day zero of infection and you can see that we have nice waning curves and I censored them at reinfection. So what we're gonna do or what we're planning on doing is estimate these waning curves um, to get an idea of the waning dynamics and also um, to understand new infections versus reinfections. Then we would also like to determine the association of antibodies with reinfection. Mm, and another thing is that we want to do is what Sheila is going to talk more about is to link the data with the ISIS data from for Ontario donors so we can actually get some of the, so we can get the vaccination data. We know when they were vaccinated and with which vaccine types. Okay, hi everyone. So, um, uh, oh, what are you doing? Okay, <laughs> sorry, Babesia came up. <laughs> like it's rushing me not here. <laughs> yeah, not time yet. Um, yeah, so there were some, th th there are a lot of limitations in our study. Um, I think um, a number of issues with the assays that we, we used, that we, they, we had to implement when we had to implement and we used what was there. Um, still the anti-nucleal capsid assay is not standardized. Um, the, um, the, there is a risk that um, some infections may be immunosilent, so uh, we're not going to be able to measure that. Maybe if we get the PCR testing. Um, the, um, I think there, there are issues with the frequent plasma donors that we were using. Um, they, um, they are perhaps not representative of the, the gen pop um, and not even of donors. And of course, there's no uh, universally defined correlate of immunity. So let me go back now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so at Canadian Blood Services, we are making some changes uh, that I think will in the future help us to do uh, things that we were more difficult during the pandemic. So for one thing, we are increasing plasma apheresis collections and expanding the number of uh, plasma donor centers in different parts of the country. Um, we're not doing that for research, we're doing that because we need more plasma, but it will have that, um, that um, extra benefit. Um, and we now encourage first time donors to come in and donate plasma. Previously, they were uh, people from the whole blood program that were moved over um, who wanted to give more. We also will develop a way to uh, collect questionnaire data, which would have been so important over this time. Um, we, we could get information from a questionnaire on, um, on infections, on uh, their vaccination history, and we also um, could uh, get um, information on risk factors, uh, 
which we had to do from uh, things uh, that, that were very general in the donor's, um, um, the donor's um, 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 residence and, you know, so the regional areas and that sort of thing. But, uh, but in the future, we will have that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we did not have a way to select samples a priori. So what we had was just random cross-sectional samples, and sometimes we got lots from the same donor, and sometimes we didn't. Okay. Um, so as you uh, one moves to analysis, you start to think about, you know, um, what, what else would it have been nice to have? And I think that's, there's things that, if we had HemaNet, we might be able to address some of these questions. Um, so one is, how can we standardize anti-N measurement? Another is, what is the best way of standardizing anti-S neutralization? Um, and when it comes to, uh, to more to the sampling, how could we compare frequently sampled donor data, even if we had expanded plasma collection, frequently sampled donor data with the general population? Um, and I, I think there are some solutions out there. For example, um, in lockdown, maybe we could have gotten very frequent um, blood spots from, uh, from selected people. Um, it's challenging in the lab to, do, to compare with a venous sample, but um, there, there may be opportunities out there to, for improvement. Um, I think what is the best sampling strategy is, um, is a big one. Um, that it obviously depends on what you want to do, but we wanted to do quite a few things um, as it happens. Um, so we did cross-sectional. It's great for just getting a picture of what's happening across the country. Um, if you, we, we could do um, to uh, repeat sampling, um, so bring in more whole blood donors if we could select, say, four people who donate four times a year. Um, but the plasma samples give you that really, really frequent um, sampling. Um, and so, so it just it depends on what you want to do. Um, you, if you do the, the cohort, it, it's not so good for the cross-sectional um, uh, look at what's happening everywhere. So, so, you know, I think there's a lot of thought still needs to go into the best kind of sampling. Um, and um, what is the best way to analyze zero surveillance data? As you can see, it's very complicated and we still have um, some post-pandemic thinking to do about what best to do with these. Why are these data important? Um, it's going to give us a detailed historic picture of the immunity dynamics um, within individuals. Um, the, uh, the CBS sampling and processing infrastructure, we got better over time. I think we can do a whole lot better um, if we, uh, in, in the fullness of time with, with some structural changes. Um, and um, uh, despite a biased population, these data will give us a lot of data-driven insight into antibody waning and repeat infections, which can be integrated into um, uh, population modeling. And uh, how will these, this drive policy changes? Well, I think that um, uh, as we see, we're going to see what we find with the data, but um, there's the potential for uh, age-specific um, uh, policies um, uh, for vaccination, which will depend on the seroconversion uh, rates and uh, repeat um, infections in, in different um, age bands. Um, and then there's the potential to integrate um, antibody waning into the wider seroprevalence um, estimates. Mm -hmm. And so I will thank you for your attention there. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we'll take some questions for Sheila and Iris now. And since I'm moderator and I want to ask one, I'll take the first one. Uh, so um, Tim, in his initial slides this morning, had this figure of these blood drops and CBS had this really impressive amount of samples that you were able to test, just putting the rest of us to shame. But what I think um, now looking back, are you, and because you were talking about these questions around sampling, now looking back, what are the sort of lessons learned and are you looking at the data depending on the questions around what is the optimal number of samples uh, to test to answer these questions and do a million samples needed to be test or, or for some questions you need more for some less and I wonder if these analyses are underway. Thanks. 
Well, we definitely do have plans to look at a sampling plan. Um, that's, um, I, I think how many samples you needed, it, it depends on a lot of things. Like initially, the prevalence was really low, so you needed a lot of samples. As uh, time moved on, the, the prevalence was higher, but we were more interested in doing things that were more regional, so then you need a bigger sample. Um, and uh, our sampling method was um, like we, we just, we really were just randomly selecting samples without knowing who they were until afterwards. So, um, so, so that did not lend itself to a more specific um, sampling strategy. But I think maybe we could have gotten by with less. I, I, I do think that um, we all probably tested more than we needed to simply because it was a bit clunky how we were going to select them. And, and for the record, you did amazing, given that we weren't able to think about these things in real time. <laughs> but I will hand it over to the next question. So any plans for the question is, any plans to integrate a covalescent plasma program? I know there was, you know, controversy about the efficacy and effectiveness of the program. But in times of uh, emergency, um, often that will be an important strategy to to think about uh, we, were, okay. we, were yeah. we were involved in uh, clinical trials uh, at CBS and that's in fact how we got into the antibody business because there was no standard test at the time mm -hmm. um, we are supporting one more clinical trial right now at CBS and we're doing it in the same facility in Ottawa where we have a, a, a research lab that does that work and does surveillance work as well Thank you. And then I, uh, the comment is that um, for standards, to build standards or validation panels according to regulatory bodies, uh, one thing that was very important at the beginning of the pandemic was finding proof of infection with PCR testing and that data available and confirmation of that in order for these samples to be included in a validation panel to evaluate suitability for emergency use approval by FDA. So that's gonna be very important for us in the future, you know, just take that into account. I know it's not easy, it's difficult, but proof of that, uh, as well as proof of vaccination, if we wanna create standards from vaccinated individuals, we need to know exactly one is administered, which type of vaccine, how many doses. So that information, thank you so much for, you know, including that. Coming back to the comment by the previous presenter that in measles, if you had two immunizations, you're considered protected even if there's no antibody response. And I know that happy there's also some data that there's um, protection without antibody response. And, and you have all these samples. Is there a need or can we neglect this that uh, we need to um, figure out what the protective correlate for T cell responses is and if we if we need to put this together or if we can just say antibodies is good enough. Um, we have uh, considered T cell um, but it's very hard for us to collect the right kind of sample for that. Um, we are using leftover a leftover vial of sample that they spin down and freeze uh, the plasma and then we test it. So that, that's why we have not done it. It doesn't mean it couldn't be done in the future um, for different, it, we're, we're trying to grow and develop the blood service to be able to do different things. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on that one too, uh, is, is if, if it has to be coupled too with if the, the, the measure of the vaccine uh, success is antibody. If the vaccine actual subunit is not able to induce a strong T cell response to begin with, it kind of cripples the <laughs> case to try to make that CMI is important, the cell mediated immunity is important. So the input has to drive that output measure, right? So if your input is favoring antibody to begin with, which largely many vaccination strategies have been built to do, then it's you're kind of using, you get cases where trying to make the case that CMI is, is super important too, is weakened by the input. Mm -hmm. So if you know, vaccines are using mRNAs and, that are driving T cell oh. responses. And these are like big questions for diseases that are really hard to overcome because we know like for HIV and Hep C antibodies, not enough, mm -hmm. but the vaccines were originally designing just for antibodies. So you have to have approaches. Anyways, that's a design issue. Um, mm -hmm. 
So my second, I'm, a, I'm clearly an immunologist, T cell bias. <laughs> but uh, the second question I had was all this great data you have and the emphasis being on sex stratification, which is important because when you're old, you make antibodies at lower levels and they wane faster, clearly. Mm -hmm. But what about the sex effects? I mean, it's these are being reported and uh, I think, you know, we're uh, remiss if we don't, at least for the surveillance, speak in the language of men and women respond different immunologically and this is information that's important to pull out of this, uh, this resource and what are you gonna do with that information? Yeah, thank you for that comment. That or question, both, I guess. Um, like, this is definitely something that I will take into account when I go further into the modeling of the waning. So have, you haven't asked the question of, of men and women different in your data set? Well, so I got on this project two weeks ago. Okay. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I, have not, I have not really looked at it yet, but when I model it, I will definitely take this into account. No, it's not much difference. I mean, we look at the seroprevalence all the time. And yeah, it's not much different. Um, you know, and I think what it what we have seen is that there were different that it wasn't so much a sex difference. It was more that, for example, vaccination was rolled out to hospital workers who are more likely to be female. So you see a bit of a difference initially. Then it comes back together. And uh, I, I some I, I think there are there's a little teeny weeny bit more males that have been infected than females, mm. like as with many infections, but I, I, I'm not really seeing a lot of difference there. I'm also sneaking in here because I think it's such a good question, but because I think we also have to look quantitatively, right? Because you do see that with influenza, you do see that with other um, pathogens, but your data also shows it was white males over the age of 60. So I donated blood last year for the first time, so I do encourage maybe others also <laughs> to do that so that we can get to that source of data. Our next speaker, I don't have the bio in front of me, but was already introduced by Prativa. So it is Dr. Steve Drews um, from Canadian Blood Services to present the, the Babesia use case for zero surveillance. Let me see if I can get this uh, right here. I don't, uh, maybe, maybe not. How do you go for it? Oh, yeah. So today I'll talk about Babesia and other rare tick-borne diseases that can help us prepare for emerging pathogen events. Um, these are my conflicts of interest. Um, and essentially here, um, we have key objectives are to understand the changing risks of these tick-borne diseases in the, in the blood supply, but also in the general population, to describe a plan or attempt to, to study the prevalence of these uh, agents in blood donors, um, and possibly augment them with other types of specimens. Um, and to look at how studying rare emerging pathogens that are tick-borne can help us prepare for the next emerging event. In this case, it would actually help us prepare for a parasite, atypical bacteria, as well as a vi potentially viral event. So blood operators, uh, we collect blood. That's our primary role. There are, there are two main blood operators in Canada, uh, Canadian Blood Services and Hema Quebec. There's also, in some provinces, private uh, plasma collection facilities. Um, we collect about 800,000 um, specimens at Canadian Blood Services per year. Um, most of our donors are repeat donors. So we have a climate change problem globally, and we have a climate change problem in North America. As blood operators, we actually look at climate change as an operational risk, but as the microbiologist at Canadian Blood Services, I also look at um, uh, climate change as a risk in terms of emerging pathogens and their effect on the blood supply. And uh, that's actually a big part of my job is to do those risk assessments. With climate change, we've seen modeling uh, from Canadian colleagues suggesting that uh, we're, we're expecting over the next uh, 70 years to see changing patterns in the distribution of exodes ticks in North America. As you can see, a uh, northward and westward move uh, of these ticks um, into areas of Canada, including uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, where currently there's no um, um, population that can with withstand the cold weather. But the idea is that as climate changes, weather changes, um, we're expecting to see that a change in distribution. Interestingly, um, the areas that we'll see expansion to are the areas where CBS collects most of its blood. The most uh, important agent to us, and the one that in the US has caused the FDA to suggest that blood donors in certain states all get a NAT screen, um, is Babesia. 
Um, this is an intra-erythrocytic parasite, so I'm going to break the, uh, the mold here today. We're no longer talking about serology alone. Um, we'll talk about serology, we'll talk about PCR, and we'll talk about specimens that include red cells, um, white cells, and plasma or serum. The other problem we're facing is that in parts of North America, it's possible that this Babesia parasite is also being transmitted by another tick. And it's possible that this is a Dermacenter albopictus, and we're seeing changes in epidemiology on the western side of the U.S. with potential risks to uh, pop the population in British Columbia, where there is really no border, and the farmland in, Al in Abbotsford just is contiguous with the remainder of Washington State. So why are we concerned about Babesia? Recently, um, Evan Block out of Hopkins and myself put together a group and we put together a paper for JCM talking about uh, risks of transfusion transmission of Babesia. We did talk about some other agents. Um, and for us, um, a transfusion transmitted event, our colleagues from Yale did some look at the literature, could be as high as 20% fatality. Um, regardless, we don't know, um, in many cases, with the denominators in that, that population. There's drawbacks to some of the analyses. But these are significant infections um, via tick-borne transmission and via blood transfusion. And we don't have data for Canada in terms of cost. So again, that's a potential research study right there. But when people do have significant illness, it's not cheap. So this is something we put together looking at um, how we might consider looking at uh, prevalence in blood donor populations. The question here is do we need to aug augment uh, blood donor specimens? But essentially looking at areas of higher risk of transmission, at least for Babesia, as you can see on the left-hand side, a higher risk region, a moderate risk region, and a null risk region. Those aren't monoliths. Um, because this is tick transmitted in, nat in nature, um, each of those areas are going to have a potentially different window period where tick transmission will occur. The primary screening methods for Babesia is essentially a whole blood or a red cell lysis in a PCR. That's the most developed of the tests. The gaps are that there's no standardized testing really for anaplasma and, and uh, Powassan virus PCR apart from reference labs. <coughs> and a big problem is that we also have a lack of good high throughput serology for all three targets. We have to have better linkage to history. We have to have better linkage to public health. We also have issues where this is reportable in some provinces and not. We do have national case definitions that we worked with PHAC on, but this is not consistent. Um, we also don't have a good sense of the genetic characteristics of those agents because they're so rare in Canada. They're here but we don't know how diverse there are in many cases. I put this table together, and really the key takeaway points here are is each of these agents has a different um, time frame where it dwells in the blood. It has a different compartment where it lives in, in, the, in the blood as well. And in general, um, NAT assays are not standardized, and serology assays are not standardized either. <coughs> Sorry. So the idea here would be, could you potentially collect <coughs> whole blood and then use a lysis tube that's commercially available to do nucleic acid testing? Um, if you find specimens, you could use that data to do epi studies and also genotyping. But potentially, you could also do um, sero serology assays on paired plasma, sorry. <clears throat> the, the problem here is that we don't have a standardized methodology for serology. And so we would potentially have to look at um, multiple targets to do serologic analysis. We've seen um, anaplasma activity in, in north or south eastern Ontario as well, and that's a potential risk area. In this case here, the pressures are greater because, again, um, the serology assays are not well established. We also don't have standardized PCR methodologies as well. And you can see that here in this table. The dwell time for this, this agent is, is actually 
shorter than what we would see for Babesia. And because of that, um, using a NAT assay in different regions, you would have to pinpoint the time where you thought that the, the questing tick was out there transmitting this agent. And so a serologic assay may help you at the start to figure out who's actually getting exposed or infected. Because if you don't pick the right time for the NAT assay to be done, you could miss that blip. We also don't know the difference between years and seasons, and that time frame for sampling may vary between years. A similar approach would go on here as well. These, these assays, the serologies or IFAs, are very, very labor intensive. You could try to pool these. You might lose some sensitivity. The idea would be to capture as many positive specimens as possible so you could cross-validate panels. This, this serology assay, if you could get a, an EIA, would be highly multiplexed as well to get the most sensitivity for convalescent plasma or serum. For Powassan, it's just as difficult. This is one of the more rare vi viruses around, although it's been identified in Ontario back in the, the 50s. This, this agent here, again, has a short viremic period, and we don't have good serology for this at all. The problem in this case is different in that the serology for flaviviruses is often nonspecific. So could you go for a very general flavivirus serology assay and then get a sense from that whether you could drill down then using other methodologies like print to do a species or, or a genus or species specific um, uh, um, assay in this case. <clears throat> when you do um, knowledge translation activities for these agents, when you're doing surveillance, it actually, um, in these cases, they're often reportable or they're of concern clinically. And so what you're essentially trying to do here is um, Think about how you're going to inform public health on the, the positivity rates, and then how you're going to also partner with, with, with reference labs across Canada and potentially globally to do characterization of these. Um, positives in blood donors actually in most cases would activate what's called a look-back investigation. The last time we had a Babesia look-back investigation was before the pandemic. It occurred in one donor in one province, but required us to engage public health in two provinces the National Center for Parasitology Reference Center in McGill, as well as National Micro Lab. So these can be ex extensively complicated, but help us in many ways build connections that allow us to um, do these investigations. So how would a study that looked at this fill our gaps? Um, I think we can look at lab, epi, data linking, and sharing. And each of these here, um, we could essentially allow us to get past some specific barriers right now operationally as well as data linking that allows us to um, deal with the, the, the problems that I've, I've identified in trying to do a surveillance program for each of these. There's nothing really here out of a box except for possibly the Babesia NAT which might clear, clear Health Canada in the next 18 months. But really the remainder of those targets are going to be lab developed, require standardization, and then linkage with public health and an understanding at the national level what's going on. And that's it for my time. Sorry for my sore throat or whatever that was. But. <laughs> um, so we'll take questions. We might have a floating microphone, but there are online participants, so, so we'll take those questions. And, and while you walk up there, I'll just say, I really like <coughs> that you highlighted that there are no assays, for example, or no great assays. And I think, you know, there was from Mark andre and maybe in the morning an earlier question about partnering with research, or even a question came up about industry. And so this is, I think, where those partnerships probably become very important to develop those. Morshed. Yes, thank you, Steve, for a nice presentation as always, but I, I think the area that you touched is that uh, I have some interest in all those, those areas. And uh, um, yeah, Dr. Sekirov and Agatha Zassim, then myself, we did some work using, during this COVID time with the multiplexing, which team mentioned that uh, we now need the multiplex serology. So I think that this, this would be a classic example that where we can use the like MSDS, for example, that you can use 10 analytes. So you can use the all anaplasma, Babesia, Lyme, Rickettsia, you name it. Similarly, for arbovirus, you can put the all the arboviruses there, including chikungunya and other things. So I, I think that we should look at, but the problem that 
that nobody wanted to cough up money for these low-hanging fruits. So my question to you that what are your strategy to convince people to get money for this kind of stuff? So, so I think a key strategy is that some of these are, are transfusion transmitted. So I can try to get, you know, approach that way to kind of get resources to support some of that. I think the other component is, is that really when we do this work, it's a key public health function and it's, it's supporting kind of the larger arthropod borne study stuff that we're doing at that national sharing table level. I, I think we're gonna have to go for grants and we're gonna have to go for things like CFIAs. We're gonna have to try to partner with industry we partnered with industry to try to do surveillance. We, we, my, my conflict is, I mean, I do engage with Roche. They have a lysis tube, for example, that is now commercially available. It's gone through Health Canada. We can use, um, I, you know, and there, there are partnerships I've had with them in looking at emerging uh, viral pathogens as well as emerging parasites. So I think trying to build, you know, if we could get something going here and with that, that project theme, um, that would allow for us to leverage resources across multiple areas, right? Classic granting in industry and then public health surveillance. Thanks. Can, can I add to that? Because I'm just like waking up on BC time. But I think, <laughs> and, and just to say that it's, it's often a struggle though because there are priorities in health and sometimes the ones that we're interested in don't fall on the priority list of the calls. But zero surveillance, I think one of the priorities for research grants that we should try to focus on is Canada's priority to serve underserved populations and indigenous populations and other who will be disproportionately impacted by emerging diseases from climate change by those. So actually just with my grant strategy hat on, maybe I would go for those also. And I think the other uh, important population is also the immunocompromised and the yep. elderly people with immunosuppressed. Yeah, so mortality is very high in individuals for Babesia who are immunosuppressed. So um, asplenic individuals are particularly at high, higher risk for death in this. So that's kind of the work that Peter Crouch showed with his, his review of the data. And then my other question is, um, there was huge developments in lateral flow, mm. um, and I know those, you know, not necessarily multiplex, some are working on that. Have you uh, contemplated potentially integrating on zero surveillance some lateral flows for some microorganisms? Because that may be a low cost also yeah, type I mean, of some, strategy. We, we, you know, we go back to the pandemic where we thought about lateral flows and maybe taking a hit sensitivity. I think we're gonna have to oversample in these populations to find these relatively rare events. So the numbers I'm showing you of 16,000, that's a four month period sliding across different areas. That's essentially every donation in the province of Manitoba. So I, you know, I, I, I can't visualize doing a lateral flow on those. When we did stuff with the American Red Cross uh, in 2018, I was involved with, we did a Babesia NAT and then we took a subset and Laura Tenetti at the ARC did um, pooled specimens together to do IFA and lost some sensitivity, but found that you know folks that were positive elsewhere and were not negative. I think we're going to have to find a high throughput serology, because I do think the problems we're going to face are picking the wrong time. The time will vary, like just like West Nile, totally different agent. Probably you know you've got a questing tick that's sitting on a piece of grass. That's going to depend on um, whether it's cold, too cold, too hot what's going on that year, does it get washed off with the rain? And um, that's gonna vary from year to year and seasonality will shift and it also shift between the regions. So I, I think an oversampling approach for a relatively rare event is maybe epidemiologists will bark and it can be kind of strange, but I think when you're doing hunting like this, it's probably the best and single, single unit testing for NAT and then potentially finding a single unit test for serology for some of these targets as well. So these, these are significant, but I think also picking a high prevalence that we would definitely go with Manitoba and then go with Nova Scotia um, because those seem to be the highest risk areas and try to get everyone there just to see like what do we have to adjust with these types of studies. Yeah, and I think uh, one important thing with the plug and play serology technologies that we have now that in one week we can produce a serology assay I think a critical aspect is gonna be uh, the antigen selection and the quality of that antigen. We noticed that proteins production quality can vary widely and so having that type of infrastructure or collaboration 
with a protein expression group that can actually produce the proteins with the yeah. highest quality. Like a lot of these here are the targets they were using were clone and E. coli. So is that the most appropriate system here? Um, I don't know. So. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious to know whether there are serological assays for tick uh, salivary proteins and is in the, in the uh? for alpha gal or there is well I um oh, okay. no I haven't oh. seen them okay. but are, are, I I think you're getting are you getting on alpha are you thinking about alpha gal in this case which would be oh, a sugar? I, I'm not sure the exact protein I just know in the malaria world there are serological assays for anopheline salivary yep. antigens as a marker of exposure and so that might be one way to get a, a you know a measure of exposure of tick exposure yeah um, when you're looking for these rare events of yeah. infections yeah. so you know like it's a good thing it's a good point I just we were talking at CBS I mean totally different topic but Lone Star tick in the states will will when it bites you will inject a sugar into you mm -hmm. and and uh, you'll build antibodies and then you can't yeah. eat red meat yeah. so you get alpha gal and we don't have that here yet but that's a, a you're actually looking at all th that clinical scenario to inform you on where the Lone Star tick might exactly. be. Yeah. So I, I don't have the biomarker data on that, but it might be good. We had we had a really good relationship with NML, PHAC, on, and, and Robin Lindsay on where ticks would be. So the numbers that we used were what Sheila came up with for the top, and that was based on our discussions with Hema Quebec, CBS, PHAC, and, and also PHAC, some engagement with mm -hmm. the tick people, and then Evan Block from, from Hopkins was yeah. involved with that as well. Yeah. Sweet. Yep. Uh, comment from Lori Beach. Sure. Oh, hi. I just, I was listening to the uh, the comments around Alpha Gal and she got a little bit. There. Yeah. <laughs> or you can read the question out. Oh. Uh, can you hear me now? Mm. Sorry, I don't think we can hear, but I think. Oh, dear. How about now? I can hear you. Yeah. You can hear me? Yeah. Cool. If you can hear me, I just got all excited because we're um, actually looking at implementing alpha-gal assays in my center where we do allergy testing. So Fadia makes a version, which I think is exciting. Yeah, I don't know if there's a, a, a correlate in Babesia, but it's a good question because I think we talk about it all the time. You know, and, the, and, and America's blood uh, banks, I think one of the blood operators has a thing on, can you don donate blood if you if you have a flagal? So these are relevant in general and also to blood operators. Okay, thank you for that, Steve. We've got 30 seconds to spare, but that's good. You're keeping us on time. And also, I know I'm scared to go next because Steve will keep me on time, so I'm next. Hi, Agatha Jassim, um, microbiologist from the BC Center for Disease Control. And um, first, I just want to acknowledge that I live and work on the beautiful, unceded, and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Coast Salish, and uh, Squamish uh, nations. And the thing that moves the slides. Okay. So. And, and just in that context, who I am, because that's the setting sort of for the presentation, is, you know, we're going to be talking about sort of what we can do um, and, and the example of MPOX in a public health lab to for zero surveillance programs. So with our roles in, in building diagnostic and surveillance strategies, um, considering emerging pathogens as a provincial lab and how we should surveil them. And I'll just say, you know, in the reflection again, Tim, early this morning, referencing your slides, but of sort of, you know, going through the pandemic, if you were a clinical virologist, you went straight off the Omicron wave to responding to avian influenza to responding to MPOX. So that was a wild ride. And so I'll tell you a little bit about MPOX and then maybe actually tie in avian at the end. So if you don't know much about the global MPOX outbreak in 2022, um, from May, there were a number of cases reported in non-endemic countries and a rapid increase primarily in gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Diagnosis was from lesion PCR, so this is just your, um, I'm giving you the sort of FYI's bullet points here. And so you can see the sort of epi curve. I'm not an epidemiologist. I think that's an epi curve where the sort of global cases went up um, in, that, in that sort of central graph. Um, 
in the spring into the summer, and then the case counts went down. And so it was this really rapid explosive outbreak, and then all of a sudden we weren't detecting very many cases globally at all. And then that second graph just shows you that this was, again, globally, including in Canada, but really in, in many non-endemic regions. And at this time, BC and other uh, provinces in Canada and other regions of the world had uh, vaccination campaigns specifically. Uh, for high-risk individuals of MPOX based on who, who were getting infected, and that was Invimune, which is based on vaccinia virus, a related orthopox virus. So just with your serology hat on, hi, vaccinating with a related virus, um, how is that going to work for serosurveillance and cross-reactivity? Um, and of course, those persons who got smallpox vaccine, who are now about um, over the age of 50, is also a vaccine based on vaccinia virus. So also an orthopox virus also will elicit an IgG response to an orthopox virus. But because of the case counts that uh, did go down rapidly, uh, in BC specifically, the outbreak was declared over in January 9th. So why is there even a case for MPOX zero surveillance at this time? And by the way, my timer hasn't got on, so I'm going to just keep going. Uh, oh, now it started. Good. <laughs> oh, you took off some minutes. OK. So and this is the current ongoing activity for MPOX. I'm showing the Canadian graph and BC. And again, you see that rapid increase in the number of cases in 2022. But what I hope you see is also this tiny, tiny incremental continued increase nationally and in provinces, um, mostly the bigger provinces who experience more cases. And so I want to give you sort of a closer picture on BC because that's what I have access to um, in terms of data. And this is what MPOX looks like in BC now. Here's just a snapshot of fall of 2023, one year after this you know, um, really big outbreak. And we had a trickling of cases. Um, the sort of line in the middle blue is one case a week. Anything, the dots above that is two cases a week and on the lower end is zero cases a week. So we've, this is the, the, just this last fall where we were getting one to two positive cases a week in Sept every week in September, splattering of cases throughout the fall. And we've had periods where we go no cases and then case counts like this. Very interesting. Here's wastewater level data. Oh, so I love the sort of whatever we called it, um, you know, connecting this surveillance strategies because here's the, sur here's the wastewater data that I also look at weekly from our um, colleagues at the NML. And you can see the red is positivity with the gray is sort of weak positivity, splatterings of positivity. And where we sometimes get cases, often aligns with clusters, sometimes we get positive wastewater signals, no clinical cases. So something is going on, what's going on? So some unknowns in BC, which I think translate to other pro provinces, is, well, we're not sure exactly even the transmission pathways. Often when a case is diagnosed, there's unclear transmission links, and the vast majority has, have no travel. Um, so we make some assumptions based on exposure data on how it's transmitting, but again, don't have concrete data. And we don't understand the extent of asymptomatic, posse-symptomatic, you know, very few symptoms, mild symptoms, undiagnosed cases. We, and we are probably missing these cases um, uh, because of the data that I just showed you. And there are, there's this one study in EID that recently came out that shows if they did add-on PCR testing in MSM specifically during that major outbreak, um, when it wasn't initially added, there was a 5% positivity rate by PCR. And when they used orthopox virus serology, so not specific to MPOX, so though they tried to control for vaccination, they detected 8% IgG positivity and 1% IgM. So maybe there are some cases that are undiagnosed. So the value of zero surveillance, we were asked to sort of bring that to here. And I think I'm in the lab, so what I do is I talk to people. And here are some of my epi counterparts, Mayank, who I work closely with at the BCCDC. And I say, you know, I'll tell you what I think, tell me what you think. And I sort of made him write something for me. And he basically said that zero surveys are, so this is his quote from the email, are, are very useful <laughs> for population risk assessment. And it can inform public health measures, including education, vaccination strategy, isolation, and quarantine in general, and also specifically for MPOX. I say this because I, we don't work in silos. I don't determine that my lab efforts are going to inform public policy. I ask those people who decide it's going to inform public policy. So then, uh, how do I go back? Do I? The red, the red oh, OK. Maybe I had it later. That's OK. 
And so what was the path to sort of MPOX zero surveillance in BC? Well, we had these local conversations. We established lab, um, so these conversations at BCCBC and other conversations. Uh, we established, we had established lab infrastructure and expertise because of COVID-19 funding, largely, vastly because of CITF funded grants. So I can't overemphasize that, that the reason we were able to launch MPOX zero surveillance and validation is because we had a team of people, the lab equipment, and the money to get started off the ground before other money came in because of these funds. So this would not have happened without it. Um, we were able to get some funding via CHR and POX grant, and um, we're working on some approvals and, and have some approvals and are getting others. What's really lacking in our surveillance strategy in BC is pan-Canadian conversations. There's no venue apart from this meeting today, for me to talk to my other colleagues in other provinces to say, hey, we're doing this for MPOX zero surveillance. What do you think? Tell me what I'm missing in my design. Would your province be interested? Um, so I'm, the need for a network is quite obvious to me. And then here's my other sort of partnership and also my name drop of the day, <laughs> is that, um, again, not working in a silo in the lab, making sure I'm, I'm, I'm do, make, doing the right projects that have the m impact is, you know, I'll also go and write an email to Bonnie Henry and I'll say, you know, I'm doing this validation work. But actually, the reason why I wrote to her is because how do approvals happen quickly? Well, there's two pathways that I've learned in BC. Um, to get something like access to vaccine registry data, you can write a big application, go through a process, eventually one day get approval, or you write an email to Bonnie because you're already in public health, you're at the BCCDC, she knows this quite well, and later that day she says, yes, I approve that you can have access to that vaccine registry data. Again, it's approval by the PHO. And so, and I, I bring this example here because again, I think it's about sharing so that others can try to do the same. Although now I hope not to get her in trouble because <laughs> it's a very important relationship. Um, <laughs> so what we're doing, I do want to give like just a tiny bit, a couple of slides on sort of the data and what our strategy is, is to provide estimation of MPOX infection prevalence is our aim. Uh, we think it will be higher than what we see from the case counts, and I've shown you sort of justification of that. And we're validating and planning to use an MPOX-specific IgG test because of that cross-reactivity issue with vaccinia. That other EID study was able to do that when people were just starting to get vaccinated, but now um, in the, in the you know, GBMSM folks who are at highest risk of MPOX still, they are largely vaccinated with one dose. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about our samples in another slide, but it includes consented participants and residual blood. So what assay are we using? Um, thinking back to the pandemic again, I was actually on maternity leave, not ideal for a virologist, um, with two young children, you know, one of them being a newborn, and I thought, how can I support the lab? And so I'm on the phone with a rep from MSD. Um, and, and saying, you know, and so someone sent me an email, and they have an assay for SARS-CoV-2, and it's new and it's not commercially available. And we said, we'll try it, send us some kits. And we built this relationship with them to be a sort of, you know, beta testing site before assays are commercially available. Even talking to them about design of new assays, as Morshed said, though, that's expensive. We haven't had the money for that. Um, and testing them out, and that's what happened with MPOX. This is a quantitative multiplex um, platform, and so they have antigens for vaccinia, they have antigens for MPOX, and I'm just going to show you some, a few data, and only on the MPOX. How did we do the validation? We used residual blood samples from the lab, and we were able to data link because of various approvals, including Bonnie and also Research Ethics Board, um, to vaccine registry, to symptom onset, and that was really important. So I won't go through the details, but people who tested for PCR, who were both positive and negative, and then residual blood samples collected for syphilis testing um, that were then X amount of days post uh, PCR diagnosis up to about day 200, and then also prenatal samples that were collected and stored prior to the MPOX outbreak, so in 2021, and that was another important group of sort of negative controls. So the big question about cross-reactivity is which, which antigen is the most sensitive but also specific. So I'll just show you that we looked at all of them that were on that panel, but that red box tells us that it's E8L 
That blue dot, the prenatal samples that should be negative for MPOX IgG are negative. The uninfected persons, the MPOX PCR negative persons, also on that zero line. And then as you go to a few days after symptom onset, um, those who had a confirmed PCR diagnosis of MPOX, that IgG level goes up. So that's great. We found that antigen and, and we and Sitlali determined the cutoff and did all this work. Uh, and then, so when you look at the performance based on that cutoff, it's 94% sensitivity, 97 specificity, and a great accuracy as well. What we also, again, data linkage and approvals were really important and having the conversation. So I would tell my ink, this is what we found. He said, well, have you looked at this and have you looked at that other um, data set to, in your validation? So, so we ended up looking at other pieces like vaccination status. Does it impact antibody level? Um, so if you just look at the PCR positive folks in purple and pink, you'll see that if they had no vaccine or one dose, antibody level's the same. Severity, we only had sort of number of lesions as a severity, but we were able to link to that. And you know, after seven days post-symptom onset, when we know IgG is really uh, detectable, no impact on the levels of antibody, whether it was one lesion up to 50 lesions. And HIV status, which is really important, and HIV highly prevalent in this population who's at risk for MPOX. We also showed that people who were uh, living with HIV, um, they, they had the same antibody levels to MPOX IgG as those who were not living with HIV, although notably, the vast majority were controlled HIV infections. So what are some limitations of our validation so far? Is what else could affect assay performance? Maybe other orthopox viruses, waning antibody we heard in the last presentation. I don't know how fast it wanes to MPOX. Um, I'm sure there's literature out there that I haven't read yet. And this is expensive and you need an MSD instrument, but there are alternatives. There are ELISAs that perform and we've tested it out as well and it performs okay. So that's, that's, it doesn't work for all settings. And partnerships are key. So again, I went back to Bonnie and I said, hey, I did this. And she said, this is great work and will be very helpful given the ongoing risk of NPOX. Um, and, and just again, the data linkages, the policy, in a public health lab, we are so uniquely positioned to be able to have these conversations. I think we have to leverage um, our residual blood. The participants um, that we are now going to use in a zero survey are going to be consented participants from a, an existing study in GBMSM, as well as residual sera from syphilis testing in BC, sort of similar to how we used it for the validation. Uh, but we'll select certain clinics and, and certain time points, so we still have to have those conversations. And then perhaps later, depending on what the, the analyses show, we'll extend it to other populations, not just high-risk GBMSM. So what would MPOX zero surveillance look like with HemaNet? I told you what it looks like now in BC. What would it look like if we had HemaNet? Well, there'd be provincial engagement, which again, you saw that sort of some samples come from Ontario, but that's a specific CIHR grant. It's not residual samples from anywhere else. And, and it would really help to have a conversation about design and implementation of this zero survey. And perhaps having centralized validation through a network like this. Um, and to determine, you know, uh, collect samples for QC, um, do some knowledge transfer on the technology, either centralized validation or help others set up this type of testing in their lab. And support for staffing lab equipment reagents. Again, this is all, apart from my salary, everything else is grant funded. Um, and, and it's done at the side of my desk, of course, as well. And so support for participant recruitment, ethics board applications analysis, so not just wet lab staff. And this would really allow us to have rapid Canadian zero surveys. I am getting to the end. Um, and just the sort of why, what is the value add of MPOX zero surveillance specifically, is we have to ask what are the questions that are unanswered? So who is at risk of MPOX? Who is not at risk? What is the clinical spectrum of MPOX? How is MPOX virus spreading? What public health measures can limit viral spread? Who should get vaccinated? How well does the vaccine work? And you could even look at the vaccine antigens too for another day. So I want to thank everyone in the lab, largely Dr. Sitlali Marquez, who leads all of our zero surveillance research and who's here today if you have technical questions, um, research technicians, and of course, my collaborators and friends at BCCDC. And I will end by saying this is one example of an emerging pathogen in Canada. There are others, and I think we need to be thinking about avian influenza as well in poultry workers. Other jurisdictions have seen high prevalence where it has been endemic for much longer. Thank you, zero. <laughs>
Thanks, Agatha. Uh, do we have any questions for Agatha? It's not so much a question, it's a comment to extend on what Agatha said about this being, you know, one of the few places where we can actually talk to other colleagues and get input from others. Um, and what I wanted to plug is uh, at CPHLN, uh, there are multiple working groups for multiple purposes, but there isn't currently a serology working group. We had one over COVID uh, times, but you know, then it kind of died off. But we are hoping to put forward a proposal to resurrect a serological working group at CPHLN. So any public health colleagues here today, please support it once it comes through. <laughs> yeah, and, and like that, we have a national molecular testing group for clinical labs and not a serology one. Anyway, so serology field vastly lacking in, in how we can talk. Tim. Yeah, if I were uh, Bonnie or somebody else who had responsibility, <laughs> um, I'd be looking at this and saying, is this sort of, uh, are we gonna see more orthopox virus activity coming forward? And is that in some way a reflection of the fact that there's been no active orthopox vaccination since uh, whenever we stopped vaccination, I guess it was four or five years after elimination uh, or uh, eradication of smallpox uh, in 79. So my, my question is, is it reasonable to have that concern? Are there, are there people here that feel like we should be doing more on orthopox virus because we have massive cohorts in the world that have never seen a vaccination and therefore are relatively immune susceptible and that we may be seeing much more activity on this front and MPOX is just the beginning? Or am I just being paranoid? So, um, and if I were a person that has expertise in MPOX viruses that didn't just start at that outbreak, but I will tell you my thoughts. So one is, first of all, we need to look to other regions. So after I started learning about MPOX, there's this rich level of data in the, Dem I think it's Democratic Republic of Congo, where they, again, had sort of limited zoonotic cases, she's say, shaking her head, yeah, of, of MPOX, and then all of a sudden they had these rapid increases in cases and human-to-human -human transmission, going back to at least like 2010. And it's not that we were ignoring it, it's that we're in public health always busy putting out our own fires, and there are too many fires. And so, but I think the data is there. And how does transmission happen? Well, you know, it's not new to us that um, for a it, a disease that's transmitted through intimate contact, often sexual contact, you're going to see it in, in, in individuals who have higher uh, amounts of sexual exposures, GBMSM. That does not mean the rest of us are immune, absolutely not. And so, um, and of course, Invimune was targeted only at the high risk population based on the data now, which is exactly why zero surveys are so needed. So. Are we at risk? Well, first of all, the GBMSM population is still at risk because most of them got one dose because why would you go out for a second dose when we told you the outbreak was over? And we know that it's not a great vaccine and we know that there's waning immunity. Secondly, everyone else who's you know under 50 and, and didn't get Invimune is, is completely immune to something like Mpox and absolutely we can see you know um, infections in those other populations as well. And even I'd say the smallpox vaccine, I'm not sure how well it would even work. So we are at risk and I think this should be on the radar of everyone in Canada. Yes, thank you. On, on, this, uh, on this note, uh, the first fatal human case of Alaska pox was reported last week and I wonder whether there's concern in Canada for Alaska pox infection and whether seroSurveillance would be a good tool. That's why we built the wall. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I wonder. Yeah, build the wall. That's the other solution. Some of us are in BC, so we're closer to Alaska. Um, I did not, I'm gonna have to Google that. Yeah. I did not see this Alaska pox thing. And I think, and sorry, Tim, I maybe didn't address that. There was a risk of other orthopox yeah. viruses, right? I mean, it's, it's mpox is the example that happened now. If we had the resources, the human net, the staff, we should be thinking about other orthopox viruses, absolutely. Can I ask one? Oh, yeah. So um, I was at a WHO session that addressed this, but I think the question I have is, is that we've really taken this and made it a first world problem when this has been a problem for a long time in Africa. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can take what we learn and take it back to places like the DRC or Central Africa where this is a significant problem in, in multi, multiple ways it's being transmitted and, and really nip that in the bud there where people are suffering yeah. from it? 
I, I want to call out CIHR for doing a good thing um, during this pandemic, and they do other good things, but they had a rapid response research grant um, in 2022 or something like that um, to address the MPOX um, outbreak. But they said to apply, you had to have an African partner. Um, so you had to be a Canadian institution, have an African partner, and work together and learn from each other. And that was great. The only problem was it was one grant. So there was just one team that could win it. So we decided to come together as a Canadian team with Ontario and BC and, and others um, to put together a big grant um, with, with colleagues in Nigeria. And so I, and that's allowed us to talk to the CDC in Nigeria and specific other groups in Nigeria about this. But otherwise, I think just the venues for that communication and that understanding. But I think that was a great move by CIHR and we need a little bit more of that. I don't know if I answered it. But yes, learning from each other right. and also bringing it back. Well, and so so we do talk to them like we had, they don't have an MSD instrument. It's like, should I get an MSD instrument? Well, you can do this ELISA, the ABEXA ELISA. Okay, maybe we'll do that. It works great, but not like this. So we're trying to have those conversations with one institution in one African country. Um, but maybe these conferences, you know, Bill was alluding to, these institutions who work more closely with other global partners can sort of have those conversations. Yeah. Um, more for comment. So we have a multiplex towards MPOX Saxenia in the portfolio. I'm going to spoil the presentation oh. of my colleague tomorrow. So we might speak off the record after the okay. presentation. Oh, good. Okay. Are you presenting on MPOX tomorrow? I'm your colleague. A colleague of yours. Okay. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, then I will introduce our next speaker, who is the last speaker of the session, um, who is a colleague in front of mine, so Dr. Ina Sekharov, a medical microbiologist um, at, in the Public Health Lab at BC CDC, um, and the program head for Tuberculosis Mycology Laboratory, but also has done a lot of, did I say mycology, mycobacteriology, it's just a lot of talking, um, and, um, but she's also been really intimately involved in our serology program and helped lead a lot of the SARS-CoV-2 serosurveillance initiatives, um, so she's also a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine at UBC, um, and so her interests include public health related aspects of medical microbiology, clinical applications of microbial genomics, and diagnostic methods. Thanks, Agatha. And uh, you're going to hear yet again about SARS-CoV-2. You know, I'm going to be the third speaker, so, you know, uh, talking about it today, and uh, the last person standing between you and lunch. So I do hope that if you, I'll, you know, you'll maintain your attention. Um, and um, this uh, picture here is from a cover of a WHO checklist for respiratory pathogen pandemic preparedness planning, which I thought was, uh, you know, very well put together document, but. Uh, you know, I, I did want to, you know, highlight a bit of a funny moment, I guess, you know, of uh, how when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, like I was reading it from the point of serious surveillance in mind, and when I was looking at the picture uh, on the bottom, I assumed it was an antibody. And then, of course, when my entirely non-medical, non, you know, biological husband looked at it, he said, well, no, that's lungs. And, I, you know, and I think he's right, but... <laughs> Uh, so before going further, uh, I do want to acknowledge that I'm grateful to be here on Densi the territories of the Kanyan uh, Kehaka Nation, um, and uh, it's a beautiful land. So uh, why respiratory serious surveillance? You know, again, we did talk about it for quite a while already, but, you know, uh, when you look at the most recent, uh, and most recent, I mean, like the last 100 years or so, outbreaks that have plagued humanity, nine out of 13 of them did come from respiratory pathogens. And from the same checklist by WHO, they do talk about uh, needing to have access to sensitive and specific serological diagnostic assays in place in order to be able to respond to uh, emerging respiratory viruses. And of course, you know, having uh, something in place is much easier if you maintain access to it. And we have built uh, capacity, you know, in Canada, in North America, worldwide for, ser you know, serological um, testing over the course of the pandemic, and I think it's important to try and keep it uh, afloat. Um, in Lancet, la Lancet last year, there was a little publication that's, you know, it's very short, you know, very sweet, and I think it's actually really quite great. Uh, it was uh, kind of, you know, proceeding, um, summary of uh, meeting proceedings from people in Europe who also met to discuss their surveillance initiatives and, you know, future plans. and. Uh, 
they talked about very much, uh, you know, very similar um, applications for what we have been discussing. In fact, when I have been going through that, uh, um, you know, through that paper, I was thinking, you know, did they embed somebody uh, in our meetings? Because, you know, like, it's really all the same ideas. You know, then I realized they, their meeting came first. So I thought, okay, did we embed somebody in theirs? But, uh, you know, clearly I think it's uh, maybe a case of great minds, things alike, and, you know, we do need to go forward with that, uh, with these kind of initiatives. So uh, why SARS-CoV-2 though, you know, like the pandemic is winding down, you know, like it's becoming uh, endemic right now, and why do we want to continue doing SARS-CoV-2 serious surveillance? So to uh, describe my thoughts on that, I want to go through um, some results of uh, antenatal serious surveillance that we have been engaging in in BC, because, you know, we do have, uh, you know, pretty good access to antenatal um, screening samples. So just to you know, give you a bit of an overview, uh, in BC, um, vast majority of women who are pregnant get screened uh, for a variety of things in their first trimester. So we have access to very well uh, geographically represented samples for our population. And we've been uh, collecting between 100 to 300 samples a week, roughly starting in November of 2021, with a short break May to July of 2023, but otherwise uninterrupted testing and have tested uh, you know, about 25,000 samples over this period of time. Initially, we did have linkages to vaccination and infection date. Unfortunately, we don't have them right now, but I'll make an argument that we really need to reestablish those. And uh, these samples have been tested on the same MSD platform that Agatha just described. The platform looks at SARS-CoV-2 antigens as well as seasonal COVID antigens, but I'll just speak about SARS-CoV-2. And all of the graphs that I'll be presenting have been put together by Dr. Zitlali Marcus that I'm very grateful for, you know, her uh, doing that and all the work that she does on this study. So um, this is the results of our antenatal seroservillance for SARS-CoV-2 for BC specifically. In yellow, you have people who have no evidence of uh, antibodies to either of the um, SARS-CoV-2 targets. In blue are people who are reactive to both spike and nucleocapsid, and in red are people who are only reactive to spike. As I said, we started doing this in late uh, November of 2021. That was roughly the time when Omicron was spreading in BC. And you can see that, uh, you know, initially we saw this rapid rise in the blue bars, you know, rap you know rapid rise in infections. But then the uh, levels of infected individuals have kind of stabilized. And, you know, for a while I was actually kind of thinking, well, is it really worth continuing? We're not really seeing much of a, you know, impact, uh, you know, of uh, virus on the um, NCN antibodies in the population anymore. But then starting in September of uh, last year, September of 2023, we have, uh, three, we have seen um, rising CR positivity to NCN. Uh, and uh, again, this is just look, you know, lo looking just at the NCN alone, and again, uh, you know, just kind of you know, highlighting this rise in CR positivity. So uh, you know, that you know, was really um, a clear indication that uh, you know, population level immunity still continues to evolve. Uh, despite the fact that the virus has been with us for a number of years already. And it's not just the percent zero positivity that has been changing. When you look at the levels of antibodies, uh, you can see that the spike antibody levels have been declining uh, for the last, uh, you, know, you know, several months uh, in BC uh, women of childbearing age, while nucleocapsid antibody levels have actually been rising uh, roughly throughout the same time. And uh, interestingly, when you stratify the levels of spike antibodies by uh, nucleocapsid positivity of the individuals, you can see that consistently, people who are positive for both spike and nucleocapsid have higher levels of antibodies relative to those who only are positive for spike, demonstrating this uh, you know, sustained contribution of hybrid immunity to overall um, you know, immune landscape um, that um, you know, we are looking at. So, we talked about, you know, attempts to integrate uh, different types of surveillance, and, uh, you know, we do have a very robust, uh, you know, wastewater surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 in BC. And so the question then becomes really, you know, like we already are looking at the circulation of the virus in wastewater, what can, um, you know, s uh, surveillance add on? And, uh, you know, this is still an argument that we do need to make with powers that be and, you know, to, you know try to, um, you know, have a continued support for SARS-CoV-2 serial surveillance. But I think what's interesting to observe here is that, so um, and this graph, you know, like uh, it shows different uh, wastewater plants that have been sampled in different areas of BC. 
and uh, the blue line is that September 2023 time point. So anything to the, I guess, what to the uh, right of the blue line is uh, the more recent month. And um, you can see that while in some uh, wastewater plants there have been, you know, somewhat increase of a signal of, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater, in some other, uh, you know, jurisdictions and some other wastewater plants that uh, line has actually been relatively stable. And uh, the interpretation that has been provided for, you know, uh, for quite a while for, uh, you know, like a large number of these graphs is that SARS-CoV-2 levels are relatively stable at most sites. So um, I think this here is a clear evidence that, you know, like you can look at the levels that are being shed in the population, but it's also important to look at other parameters that might show you a bit of a different picture, you know, give you a bit of a different signal that is also worth, um, you know, worth examining. And, um, Another thing that I wanted to do is demonstrate this overlay of uh, the circulating strains in BC. So in addition to wastewater, we also have very robust uh, genomic surveillance for SARS-CoV-2 and uh, have had that ongoing for you know, pre pretty much since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, here you can see the um, predominantly circulating strains overlaid uh, below uh, the um, uh, NCN positivity in our population. And uh, this is uh, September of 2022. In September of 2022 was the first introduction of bivalent uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Those bivalent vaccines were targeted against uh, BA4 and BA5 variants. And BA4 and BA5 variants are those purple variants uh, that you can see have, you know, like, uh, in, on the graph below, and they have been um, you know, making up majority of uh, variants circulating in BC last year, um, you know, over this time period. And uh, so there was a vaccine match and there hasn't been a, you know, like a not notable rise in the INCN positivity. In contrast, in September of 2023, the bivalent vaccine that has been put out to use was targeting the XBB lineage. XBB lineage is the brown lineage, and you can see that for BC specifically, the XBB lineage has actually been declining in circulation, uh, you know, towards the beginning of fall. And uh, instead, a number of other strains have overtaken and have, uh, you know, been responsible for the vast majority of at least sampled and diagnosed infections. So, you know, uh, and at the same time, we've seen a rise in the INCN seropositivity. So that kind of begets a question of, you know, is there some sort of a contribution of, you know, like relative vaccine, vaccine mismatch between what has been given to the population relative to what's circulating in the population? But uh, that's probably not the only potential answer. Uh, when we look again at the levels of um, anti-spike and anti-nucleocapsid antibodies, so already showed you this decline in anti-spike uh, antibodies, uh, you know, over the last few months. And uh, when you compare the levels of antibodies, uh, you know, in August 2023 versus August 2022, September, you know, versus September, et cetera, you can see that uh, the anti-spike levels have been consistently lower. Um, in, you know, the, these past several months and at the same time the, the year before, while again the anti-nucleocapsid levels have been rising. So, you know, maybe there is some sort of, um, you know, like lower uptake of vaccines in the population in general, you know, like lesser uh, stimulation. So, you know, maybe, maybe the vaccine uptake is something that has, you know, has to do with the rising uh, infections. But really to be able to answer that, we do need to have ongoing linkage to our vaccination registry. And I'm hoping, like I said, that we'll be able to reestablish that and actually be able to discern some of these questions a bit further. Um, another thing that we tried to do uh, with our antenatal surveillance is trying to see whether different uh, antibody isotypes, uh, you know, can give us a bit of a different picture and a more refined picture of circulation of the virus. So we were hoping to use IgA, for example, as an antibody that decays faster than IgG to try and see more of a fluctuation of uh, circulation of the virus. That unfortunately didn't actually work out, you know, work out as we planned and uh, contrary to our expectations, we did not see more significant, you know, like ebb and flow with IgA as we were hoping to see. But again, it was important to know and uh, important to understand, you know, sort of the relative, um, you know, the, the relative capacity of different antibodies to monitor immunity and virus circulation. So why ongoing SARS-CoV-2 surveillance? Um, like I said, I think it's really important to continue monitoring this virus and, you know, like gaining knowledge that, you know, will inform us on this virus as well as potentially actually give us a chance to um, better understand uh, the immunity and the circulation of viruses which are already endemic. 
and uh, for this virus, you know, there still needs to be, you know, ongoing uh, optimization of vaccine policy, ongoing optimization of public health policy, and I think zero surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 has the potential to inform on these. But with respect to other respiratory pathogens, that is actually quite a bit more complicated, at least in our initial assessments, than uh, it is for SARS-CoV-2. So SARS-CoV-2 came into this entirely susceptible population that was, uh, you know, like relatively easy to get positive and negative uh, controls to, you know, def define cutoffs, uh, to, uh, you know, have, um, you know, sort of, you know, like have better insights into what a virus does to a native population. In contrast with, um, you know, endemic viruses, you know, they've been with us for a really long time, and uh, actually early on in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, we tried to look at the circul uh, circulating antibodies to endemic uh, coronaviruses in uh, residual sera collected from uh, outpatients in our, you know, like main outpatient uh, lab. And what we saw is that, uh, you know, starting from very young age, you know, so like about the age of five, majority of people who have been surveyed had detectable circulating antibodies. So again, obviously, this is going to complicate our ability to uh, make interpretations uh, from these studies. But I think it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do them. I just think that we need to be aware of the caveats. Uh, oops. Wait. Oh, OK. So I guess this is a slightly older version of my presentation. Um, but, you know, I, I had another slide from another uh, study that looked at uh, dried blood spot testing uh, in a, a household setting. And, uh, in, you know, for, for that study, we actually try, tried to also look at um, RSV and influenza antibody levels to see whether or not, you know, we, we will be able to uh, see higher levels of RSV or influenza, you know, like in people who test positive for RSV, influenza, et cetera. And that has also proved to be a bit difficult. And, you know, just wanted to show that it also required a bit more uh, optimization. But uh, just overall, with respect to other respiratory pathogens, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, given that it is more complex to uh, survey an existing endemic pathogen that has been with us for a long time, we do need to be more choosy and, you know, perhaps more um, stringent with deciding whether we use convenience versus dedicated cohorts, and it will be really extremely important to build our biobanking capacity to be able to accumulate a sufficient number of samples that will actually, you know, eventually hopefully leave, lead us to the right answers. And, uh, you know, the answers that I'm hoping we should be able to get from respiratory pathogen surveillance overall is, uh, you know, what can we learn about endemic versus emerging viruses? And um, Agatha mentioned uh, in, uh, avian influenza. You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that, uh, you know, spreads in our population, given that we already have influenza in the population, you know, like the other strains, endemic strains. And uh, also, Flu already has a vaccine and has had a vaccine for a long time, but, you know, RSV vaccines are coming on the market, so, you know, how, how are they going to play out uh, relative to the already pre-existing level of immunity in the population to some extent? So that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, this work has been supported by really a huge number of people that, you know, like I'm very grateful for, you know, their time and education and, uh, you know, the BCCTC PHL surveillance research group, Deborah Mani and her team, who is the lead uh, for the antenatal serial surveillance uh, in Canada, uh, the BCCTC PHL team and the Canadian Immunity Task Force, who funded also a lot of, well, all of the, most of these studies. take some questions. I have one. I was going to go start. <laughs> so um, you have some really nice data. Um, and one of the slides you show spike um, arbitrary units per mil and nucleocapsid arbitrary units per mil. Um, and one of my, my pet peeves from the pandemic was is that it's, although it's nice to look at your AUs per mil, I mean, in particular for nucleocapsid, we don't really have a good standardization. So Apart from BAU, back of the napkin calculations for Spike, how do you foresee us being able to generate data from all these different divergent systems that allow us to standardize what actually is going on with other antigenic markers? You know, it is a great question, and, um, you know, I, I don't think I have the, you know, gold star answer for that, but, uh, you know, like, essentially, I think from our perspective, you know, given that... Uh, you know, we look at longitudinal data and, you know, we compare trends over time. So, you know, within our own study, you know, like we are hoping that even if, you know, like maybe the actual unit per mil is not the optimal unit per mil, but, you know, like it's the same unit per mil that we've been using the whole time. 
But uh, I think it is you know, quite key, as we've talked about already, to be able to standardize data outputs from different assays from different jurisdictions. There is a WHO standard for SARS-CoV-2, and I'm hoping that you know, like that can actually help with some of the standardization efforts. And uh, you know, like maybe in the future, there is going to be newer standards coming out you know, for you know, like newly emerging you know, strains, et cetera. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, like using standards, you know, trying to cross-validate assays, you know, across jurisdictions, I think is really quite essential. I'm gonna ask you a question. And what are the gaps in sort of influenza and RSV where there would be value add in, in seroSurveillance? So with RSV, I think it really is, uh, you know, like a very clear cut case of trying to figure out how to optimize vaccine rollout. And uh, in addition to the RSV vaccine, we also do have now longer acting monoclonal antibodies that are targeted against children. And, you know, again, sort of trying to understand, you know, where do we have pockets of higher protection, lower protection, what is protection? And, uh, you know, so like I think that's gonna be a very good case for RSV specifically. Uh, for influenza, uh, in my mind, I think the value here is going to be at really trying to optimize vaccine strategy relative to circulating strains and, you know, matches versus mismatches and, you know, like in vaccines that, you know, that get rolled out. You know, there have uh, been studies looking at, you know, like antigenic scene and, you know, like what does, you know, getting vaccinated with a mismatched vaccine, you know, do to, uh, what does it do to your immunity in the current year and the following year. So I think being able to monitor um, you know, circulating strains, vaccines, you know, vaccine-induced immunity, you know, uh, infection-induced immunity, hopefully that will be able to answer some questions on how to, again, optimize uh, vaccination strategies. Yeah, maybe we can do the online question first while you walk up, but come on. I have a question from Dr. Bradley Pickering. He is the head of the Special Pathogens Unit at CFIA. So Dr. Pickering, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Great, thanks very much. Uh, wonderful talk, it was, uh, it, it was really informative. And I guess I have more, it's more of a comment than a question. I think a lot of times in, in the work that we're doing, we're, we're looking at you know, all this genomics data and everybody's looking at new sequence and things. And I think your presentation really highlighted how much data that you can get from uh, you know, doing serial surveys and understanding even even how you talk about spike and and nucleocapsid and thinking about the trends that's going on, what could be happening with you know vaccines and and we, when we're thinking about disease, right? You can you can actually see all these trends and it gives you a a broader uh, view of everything. We're often we're, we're you know with with uh, molecular testing, we're looking at specific uh, I guess snapshots of acute infections and things like that. So uh, no, I, I just really appreciated uh, you know all of the data and and everything you brought with it and, and sort of the importance of of uh, you know the studies that you're doing. So I just wanted to say thank you for that and it was a very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. I have two questions. One is, is the data publicly available? So can investigators, of course, with the right agreements. Um, look at the data or pull it or yeah. We haven't published it yet. Okay. Uh, it is part of CACF funded studies. So I think eventually it is going to be going into the CACF, uh, you know, like overall data. Um, you know, th this is really very much fresh off the press. You know, <laughs> Sitlale was so kind, you know, she, you know, she pulled all of these <laughs> graphs together for me on Friday. Um, but uh, yeah, eventually it will be, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And then my other um, question is more, you know, kind of thinking in the future. Uh, there are a number of mucosal vaccines uh, now under evaluation, and so I'm wondering how do you see um, if we want to use uh, seroSurveillance for understanding immunity levels, um, are you considering uh, collections of, you know, saliva, some other mucosal sampling at this moment? Um, what are your kind of thinking in that area moving forward in the upcoming years? So we haven't been doing uh, mucosal sampling a whole lot. We tried at some point in time to see whether or not we can get antibody levels from gargles, because you know we did use gargles quite a bit in PC for diagnosis, but that proved to be you know like a bit more. You know, it was it was fine. I mean we, we didn't go there. I think maybe we, did, we couldn't get enough samples or something like that. I can't remember, but for some reason we decided to abandon that uh, approach. Using the samples. Do you want to come and address that? <laughs> And I know that the whole mucosal world needs huge uh, amount of standardization, but just thinking forward. Yeah, we, we do a little bit of uh, mucosal um, gargle samples. 
We did validate it, but uh, at the end, it was very complicated to get the residual samples. So we mm, did not move uh, forward with it, but the, the assay is actually validated. Yes. And, well, and maybe I'll stress other things, is without a, a properly funded program um, that's new, we just, we also had to drop it, right? Like we can't follow all, we have to decide what's a priority to follow, so just, yeah. <laughs> But I think I did see that Jen Gomberman was uh, maybe participating online. <coughs> Sorry, and uh, I know that her research team is doing quite a bit of work with salivary antibodies. Uh, so I think you know she may be a good contact for you to reach out. To. Thank you. Do we have any more? I have one. I have one question then. Sure. So I'm a taxonomy geek, and so SARS-CoV-1 and 2 are actually subspecies within the same species. And so we had like about 15 years for us to play around with SARS-CoV-1 before st like this pandemic happened. How do you foresee us being able to pivot quicker if something emerges that we're not really aware of? So, something like similar but new no, subvariant, you mean, or something like entirely? Not a, we're not talking a coronavirus, mm -hmm. we're talking another respiratory virus. Okay. How do we get our systems mm -hmm. together to be able to generate the tools without the benefit of a 15 year lead where mm -hmm. we can study a very close relative of SARS CoV? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it was something that was entirely different that we haven't seen any sort of relative before, you know, honestly, I don't know. It's, you know, like, I think it's going to have to be a gargantian effort to, like, figure out what it is, what antibody, like, sorry, what proteins it has, et cetera. Uh, if it's something that uh, is at least somewhat related to something that has been in existence, you know, like I'm kind of hoping that, you know, given that there is a bit of, uh, you know, like laxed specificity uh, in our immune responses, perhaps, you know, being able to, you know, cast a wide net and, you know, Agatha actually has a, uh, an essay, verse can, verse can essay that looks at, you know, sort of, you know, pan viral responses, perhaps, you know, being able to use those kind of approaches and trying to discern signals that, you know, rise up and, uh, group of viruses, you know, we'll be able to focus our efforts for the future. But again, to be able to do that and to be able to do that quickly, we do need to maintain capacity. And I think it's really crucial for us to be able to maintain the capacity that has been accumulated over the pandemic. Um, okay, and, and I'll just say, you know, it's also, it, and it's this, so the, the pan -viral, virological assays also have uh, antigens from viruses that infect animals, right? So yes, we don't know what's out there and, and things, but if you know if it's going to be a zoonotic pathogen, it's the importance of understanding what viruses exist there and the antigens, so that we can get a little bit of a leadway. Now there is lunch soon, but um, <laughs> we are. I'm going to just uh, we are early, so I'm just going to take a minute. Um, you know, we were asked as moderators also to maybe pose a question to all of the panelists and all of the audience because we are here sort of discussing HemaNet and this network. And this session was about specific use case scenarios in Canada for this Canadian zero surveillance network. And we mentioned a couple, uh, respiratory viruses, orthopox viruses, tick-borne um, viruses. They were kind of, well, not just viruses. There were other things in there. Pa there was a parasite there. Sorry, virologist. Okay. And so I, I pose it to you. Um, are there first other communicable diseases we should be thinking about that are important? We also heard about the vaccine presentables. But what did we miss for communicable diseases? I'm taking notes. Pathogen X. So Steve alluded to that a little bit. But, but you're right. We probably have to think about that a little more. Any other groups? Yeah, you know, the STIs, is, it's, it's interesting because when we've had these HemaNet discussions, we haven't actually maybe built in a sort of STI. And, um, and I really liked what you said, Andrea, I think, right, is about the HIV, well, HIV zero surveillance. I wouldn't necessarily do it de-identified, but you could actually potentially, I'm going to talk about HIV and then I'll hand it over to you for you know what. Um, but for HIV specifically, I think you don't want to do that de-identified, but um, I know in our population in BC, we don't know a lot about, you know, HIV rates in underserved populations. I look at Saskatchewan, who I think knows a bit more, and I'm going to bother Amanda later to figure out how they figured out what's going on in Saskatchewan. Um, so that's something. And then, you know, when we look at our priorities in BC specifically, but I'm sure elsewhere, it's the same syphilis is another one. So is that what you're thinking about too, Morshed, is sort of syphilis zero surveillance? And what would that look like? Would that be de-identified? 
that uh, syphilis is now is a BC problem. I think is a national as well as a global issue, and uh, more scary things that it was in MSM population in a specified now is becoming going towards the heterosexual population. We are seeing lots of congenital cases. I think that the identified would be better so that you are not labeling anybody. And then also another challenge to get from the all sorts of community, not only particular community. So that would be another another challenge. And of course, we have DBS testing, yeah. which I think yeah. is, uh, I mean, there's different types, obviously there's point of care, there's so many yeah. different things in the STIBI world, but maybe DBS is something that we, exactly, we so have in our province. Yeah. Go, yeah. This I, is a brainstorming I, I hate syphilis testing um, <laughs> because, I mean, RPRs, you can't do them at a high throughput, and you're really looking at waning there. Um, and then most people don't get treated early enough to lose their antigen or antibody response to syphilis. So then it's like, how do I know you were recently exposed or not? Because I don't want to look at the RPR. And so do you need a detuned assay that wanes faster than the current assays? That's my gut. Yeah, I think that, uh, Christy, to like um, argue with you, now the RPR is coming as an automation. And Ontario not, is doing the automation. It's not automated uh, it's, it's going there. Uh, I think that uh, if there is money, everything can be possible. Huh? Yeah. So we have pathogen X, we have STIBIs. In the STIBIs are also some of the hepatitis viruses and seroSurveillance, oh sorry, next to you standing there now, was also critical for hep C. As I was thinking, I also think there's not a lot known about hepatitis E in the world and less especially probably in Canada, and actually there was just some alert about ongoing activity in Europe. Um, and we we really rarely test for hepatitis E, so that's something else, yes? Yeah, so now I'm getting hyped. <laughs> 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 I think that another area is coming up, and then uh, in, in from BC, Dr. Catherine Hogan, myself, and from, uh, I know that from University of Victoria, Dr. Caroline Cameron, we are trying to do some work on metabolomics. So that will be another tool to, to do the serosurveillance. I think so, so that is very kind of emerging tools, but I think that will help a lot of pathogen to do multiplexing and there'll be many, many more possibilities. So, and I, I know there's a question, so, but I'll just follow up. So metabolome is more like markers of, I think, more, more acute disease. Well, it could be of chronic disease as well. And then just for the hepatitis C, I did get a sort of side that CBS does look at that, and it's low. And I just want to, before you comment on, too, yeah. oh, hemicobac as well, is that that's interesting, given that my understanding is it, it is more in older men who you are sampling. So that is the right sample, by the way, when we talk about sampling, I think. But that's transfusion interesting. Transmitted. And transfusion transmitted. But also food, contaminated water. Angela, right? Go ahead. Yeah, so I'd, I'd plug that too. Uh, I'm talking about more specifically hepatitis C, mm -hmm. right? So, um, which uh, can't just be in older men that we're looking at. Um, and also, we can't disregard that globally there is a major initiative to HCV elimination to which Canada and several others will fail, right? The 2030 targets. And, you know, if you know the field, this many people know they have it, this many people are treated, this many people have it and don't know it, right? So it's incumbent on a seroprevalence, uh, you didn't see my arms moving, <laughs> uh, that we, that we, uh, we acknowledge that. Yeah. And, and I think you can couple it too with HEP-D. So there's quite a bit of interest around with HEP-D, uh, our partners at NML, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, what's her name? Carla Oshaway is really into that as well. So. Yeah, and I want to comment on the Hep C because I do I do work a lot in that sphere. And and first the 90 90 90 thing is very ambitious, but it's also very yeah. ambitious because obviously we don't do testing well in the people who are at highest risk for HCV. Well, um, so the, the so government also doesn't. No, the, I'm not trying to get it up on the government, <laughs> but the case, the, the you know business yeah. case, and all of this kind of is very counter to what the scientific community, the clinical community, is pleading for yeah. through Can Hep C's um, blueprint. Right, which is please you mu you need to do this and yeah. you know screen the high risk groups more and so on and so on and the answer yeah. was no, so like there. <laughs> well, and the re the reason there. I didn't put it under my sort of zero surveillance hat on, but I agree with you, you can label it that way, is because I would put it under my increased diagnosis hat. 
um, because um, that's something that well, I know we're working on and many are working on, so I don't want to sort of do anonymized, because there was a lot of serial surveillance that identified, you know, cohorts of people born in X years that, you know, got the blood transfusions contaminated with hep C that, uh, you know, were exposed, and, and they talked about this universal screening. Now I think what we're doing is we're not diagnosing the active infections, probably a combination, though, so a role for serial surveillance. And so um, it's, it's more about increasing testing. Yeah, okay, okay, I see. And and the 90%, um, I came off a meeting just a few days ago around, you know, um, testing in Indigenous populations. If we meet 90 and we're successful, that's absolutely wrong because that means the 10% of people who have not been tested are going to be largely IV drug users, incarcerated Indigenous populations. And so we have hit, you know, that will mean we have hit nearly 100% of diagnoses in those more fortunate than others and probably very close to zero in others. But yes, I just, I get jazzed up about this topic as well. And I see your hand up, Varun, and Carmen. Hello, Carmen is on. So I'm guessing she has a question mm -hmm. or a comment because she wants uh, in this I year too. I just wanted to comment on the HCV and I totally agree with you, Agatha, that the 90% the are being tested and the 10% that we are not testing are the people who need to be tested. So we've implemented um, universal prenatal screening for all women in Alberta and we've had it uh, running since 2019. We've done a lot of analyses on these. Um, and what's really interesting in the universal screening versus the risk-based is that you pick up these um, at-risk populations like sex workers. So sex workers are not declaring to their physicians in the risk-based screening for probably a lot of social factors. Um, but we pick up people who have houseless issues, people who um, are in the sex trade, uh, and people who are IVD drug users who are not disclosing. So really that universal screening is needed for those 2030 WHO targets. Um, and one of those things that we're definitely seeing is um, a destigmatization of Siri for screening everyone you can pick up those small percentage of people that you are absolutely missing on those risk-based screening ones. So I don't see any more questions and now we're sort of, oh, maybe I see one more question. So I'm happy to keep going for a long time, but um, uh, we did capture some, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Noka. We did capture some other communicable diseases. If there's other shout them out, I wanna say we probably won't have time now to capture non-communicable markers, which are also important, but I know nothing about. But first I'll hand it over to you for a question. I think it would be also very useful, again, if the data is available, to stratify and really um, emphasize on immunosuppressed individuals. We know that mm. the death rates were so much higher uh, in immunosuppressed with, with COVID and other infections, uh, as well as the elderly and children. So, so again, how do you represent all these different um, populations in Imanet is going to be important. Okay, with that, we gave you a few use cases and there's many more that we didn't talk about. So we will take a break for lunch for everyone to think about them and plan their next projects or just meet people and have a nice lunch. And lunch is an hour. We are back at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>